Okay, welcome everyone. May I welcome you to this celebration of the International Day of Human Rights and a celebration of the 74th anniversary of the Universal Direct Declaration of Human Rights. I acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land on which uh, we're gathered here tonight and pay my respects to their elders, past, present and emerging, and of course extend our respect to any Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders peoples here to tonight. I also acknowledge uh, the Reverend, very Reverend Dr. Peter Catt, the Dean of St John's Cathedral, for whom we are most grateful for this venue again tonight, and also President uh, Claire Moore, President of the United Nations Association. Next year, 2023, on the 10th of December, is the 75th anniversary of the Universal Direct Declaration of Human Rights. And ahead of that milestone, the UN is starting uh, Human Rights Day this year with the launch of a year-long campaign to showcase the Universal Declaration of Human Rights by focusing on its legacy, its relevance and its activism. In the decades since the adoption of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights in 1948, human rights have become more recognised and more guaranteed across the globe. It has since served as the foundation for an expanding system of human rights protection that today focuses also on vulnerable groups such as persons with disabilities, uh, First Nations and Indigenous peoples and migrants. However, the promise of the Universal Declaration of dignity and equality in rights has been under a sustained assault in recent years. As the world faces challenges, new and ongoing, pandemics, conflicts, exploding inequalities, morally bankrupt financial systems, racism and climate change, the values, the rights enshrined in the Universal De Declaration of Human Rights provide guideposts for our collective actions that do not leave anyone behind. To kick off uh, this evening, I'd like to invite Agnes and Teresa from the Agnes and Teresa Peace Foundation to sing to us the Australian national anthem in Aboriginal language. Karabu Panyara Nali Nali Balinga Karasha Bugaram Jagu Gunaringu Tunga Gagu Mala Jagu Nalinga Karabu Magari Shagigan and Mala Jagu Nalinga Gari Manalinga Namalaya Bruma Vanda Jagigan Jagu Yaramanalina Nayenge Vanda Jagigan Jagu Thank you, Agnes and Teresa, and we'll hear more from Agnes and Teresa and their foundation later this evening. I'd now like to invite uh, the very Reverend Dr. Peter Catt to provide a welcome to St John's. Thank you. It's a great privilege for us to host uh, this event, and as I, uh, I also want to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land, acknowledge that the land is Aboriginal land, and one of the conversations we're having here at St John's is uh, how do we pay restitution for the land that was nicked? Something that every householder in Australia needs to think about. Uh, it's a great privilege for us to host uh, this event. Uh, the cathedral community is very much involved in advocacy for many people whose rights are traversed by our government in particular but other governments as well. And so 
Uh, for us, this is a really special day because it sets the values by which we try to do much of our advocacy. It's also wonderful to be able to do, do events that actually engage with community and help to build better civil society. So you're very welcome today and I thank you for allowing us to host this event. Thank you. Thank you again, Dr. Peter Catt. It's uh, a great honour for the United Nations Association in Queensland to be able to connect with the community through such a magnificent uh, facility as this beautiful church. And we are always grateful for your willingness to host uh, our uh, events throughout the year here. Thank you so much. Um, I'd now like to uh, invite our president, Claire Moore, to uh, provide a welcome on behalf of the United Nations Association, Queensland Division. Uh, thank you, everyone. And of course, I share in the acknowledgement of the traditional owners, and I pay my respects to elders of all cultures. The United Nations Association has been going since the beginning of the United Nations. And our job is to inform, educate, and advocate on issues around the United Nations and what the United Nations does. And as Rod has said, one of the key, key elements of the United Nations work was the Declaration on the Rights, Human Rights of People Across the World. One of the very first declarations that came down because as the world came through the horrors of World War II and looked at building a future where we would be able to have a sustainable world and a world that was based on human rights, they knew that they had to regulate and inform about the fact that all people must work together, regardless of their age, their ethnicity, their religion, their ability, uh, that that is really the basis of the declaration. And we do have copies of the declaration down the back, which Sister Rendy Flannery found in a book in, in her office somewhere. It's not a hard document to read, so if you get a chance, please read what it says because it's alive and it's challenging and it's something that we must all aspire to. And as we move into the 75th anniversary next year, I hope we'll be part of doing that through the United Nations Association of Australia. Peter, thank you for your welcome. As Rod said, um, it's almost like coming home to come to this magnificent cathedral. As people know, we have two key events each year in this building, the International Day of Peace and the Human Rights Celebration of Human Rights. And each time, we feel stronger and we feel so much part of the community by being in your place, which is what I call it. Um, we have been particularly devastated this evening by the COVID virus. I know it's an easy thing to say, but I just want, well, I'll do a thank you at the end, but I just want to let people know that we have lost our choir, our dancers, our MC, and um, Rod has stepped in extremely effectively. Thank the Lord, Scott, your will, and that we didn't lose our speaker. Um, I was really worried about you this afternoon. I was going to ring you up. Um, but in terms of the process, um, it's just one of those things, but it doesn't affect the, um, the fact that we are here to celebrate human rights. So thank you for those who've come. Um, it is an important event. Please ask us about the UN and we'll move forward. And I can see who have come, so many of the key organisations with whom we've worked over the years. The Wilf Group, always Wilf, thank you. Um, wonderful, the wonderful Sir Optimus at the back there. Um, we've got uh, Anta, uh, Reconciliation Queensland there, YNYP, UNYP, and uh, also so many groups, um, Ethnic Communities Council of Queensland and the Indian community. Um, we're all part of working together to make our world a better place. Thank you for coming. Thank you, Claire. I'd now like to invite back to the podium um, Agnes and Teresa, who are going to uh, introduce us to a, a special uh, part of the proceedings this evening. Agnes and Teresa, of course, are the Agnes and Teresa Peace Foundation, which they established. Uh, they've created uh, world records in memorising 193 national anthems around the world, and they're in the Guinness Book of World Records for that. And uh, they, uh, they are here tonight 
for a very special reason, and I'd invite them to talk about their foundation and the reason for their part in tonight's ceremony. Thank you, Rod. Thank you. So, good, good evening, evening, distinguished, distinguished audience. audience. Um, so, the Agnes and Teresa Peace Foundation um, is an organization led by us. Uh, where we created a new world record for singing all the national anthems of the world by memorizing and researching all the national anthems and international languages. And also, we also created an, another world record uh, for producing the world's first um, documentary film called Salute the Nations, involving more than 75 different nationalities and prominent figures working in various fields and from all continents of the world. So Agnes and Teresa Peace Foundation focuses on creating a mentally healthy young generation. So the foundation um, aims to do creative awareness uh, and training for this in different parts of the world and to create better awareness against cybercrime and to take action to prevent climate change. So the ATPF International Award has been instituted since this year um, to encourage and honor those who are doing the best and outstanding works in schools, colleges, and universities, and in various organizations in 195 countries by implementing the Sustainable Development Goals of the United Nations, and also to those who do excellent work um, in the, for the upliftment of the weaker sections of our society and also for the philanthropic and educational work through social media. So uh, don't you all want to know who won the first at Fifth International Award? <laughs> so this is actually the uh, very historic moment for us uh, and all of us because this award is going to be brought to the next level um, each and every year. Uh, and it's being initiated today at the Sacred Place Angels Cathedral. Uh, and thank you so much. Dr. Peter Katt, <laughs> um, and through, through a very uh, great, amazing person. So <laughs> the first um, at drum the, rolls, please. <laughs> at PF International Award goes to Clem Campbell, <laughs> and um, so Clem Campbell, former president of the United Nations Association of Australia, Queensland Division, um, and UNAQ Earth Charter coordinator, and also um, past member of Queensland Parliament. Um, so past MP, sorry, <laughs> past MP of Queensland Parliament, uh, has shown many selfless services in the field of social work, and has also beautifully coordinated two international world record events under the leadership of United Nations Association of Australia, Queensland Division, um, and along with Dr. Peter Catt and St. John's Cathedral, uh, so we've chosen Clem Campbell for the first APF International Award. Um, so let's invite Claire Moore, uh, the heart of you, Nikki, <laughs> who, is, who gives more energy for our work, is cordially invited to honor Clem with the award and her message. I got a bit excited then. I thought that was the most beautiful thing. Um, Congratulations, Kim, and the United Nations Association of Queensland has a very, very special relationship with the Agnes and Therese Peace Foundation. They are, we, you are part of our family. We've watched you grow, um, and we sat through every single national anthem as you sang it and with you. Um, but more, more excitedly, it is the fact that you are leading such an important um, challenge to the world about peace and leading it by two young people. And I think um, it is very important for our association to have this relationship. And nothing makes me happier than to provide on your behalf the inaugural award to Clem Campbell, who provided such support, encouragement, and really practical assistance in developing the program, getting the whole thing up, and working with you and the cathedral community to celebrate that world record, which I think will stand forever. I do not think anybody else will take that one away from you. So it gives me great pleasure to get that beautiful award and hand it over to Clem. I also want to acknowledge the, your whole family because I know that um, you know the, the the award is the foundation is yours, but your family has been with you, and we feel that your family is part of the UNAAQ. So thank you, Mr. Joy, as well. Please check out the award. There's a lovely photo of Clem on this award, so um, it's very lovely.
Look, could I recognise you all as global citizens? And I think that's the important aspect of human rights, is that we all have to be global citizens. What, it's been a privilege to be able to support the Agnes and Teresa Peace Foundation. Just think, being able to support and help young people, that is a privilege. It's even a greater privilege to support young people promoting peace. That's the essence of our future. Because if we don't have peace, and we know what happens with conflict, you cannot respond to climate change. You cannot teach, you cannot farm, you cannot look after your children. So this is a very important project and it's great that we've got two young people who have done it. It's been my real privilege to be able to coordinate that, work with St John's, work with the media to really support the Agnes and Teresa Peace Foundation. Thank you. Uh, we were meant to give the certificate as well to Clem, so let's invite Claire again to uh, give the award, the certificate to Clem. Now let's invite um, the director, film director, actor, writer, and the APIF director, Joy K. Matthew, to present a special gift to Clem Campbell. Thank you, Agnes, and thank you, Teresa, and uh, you're doing some great work. And as Clem said, uh, it's a pleasure for us to have you as uh, collaborators uh, with the UN Association here in Queensland. And once again, uh, thanks to Clem, who does some great work supporting uh, not only Agnes and Teresa, but the youth uh, involved in the UN activities uh, right around Queensland. Now this year, the theme of the International Day of Human Rights is human dignity, freedom, and justice for all. And we're very pleased this year to have as our special guest speaker, someone who has, in many ways, blazed a trail of human rights protections here in Queensland. And I'm speaking of Mr. Scott McDougall. Scott uh, is a lawyer with a Bachelor of Laws from the Univers Queensland University of Technology who has worked on behalf of communities and worked in the law, particularly in the areas of discrimination, native title, criminal law, guardianship and coronial inquiries for many, many years. He's uh, been involved in the implementation of numerous legal and social work service programs and prior to his current position, he was president of the Queensland Association of Independent Legal Centres. In October 2018, he commenced as commissioner of the Anti-Discrimination Commission of Queensland, which has now become the, human rights, the Queensland Human Rights Commission. Um, and he was also, before that, director and principal solicitor at the Caxton uh, Legal Centre here in Brisbane as well. So he's had vast experience in protecting uh, the most vulnerable Queenslanders uh, in their rights and human rights. And tonight, in his role as uh, Commissioner of the Human Rights Commission of Queensland, we welcome Scott to present our keynote address. Thank you very much, Rod. Um, I was saying to Wendy, uh, as I came in, that uh, it's been a long time since I've been in an Anglican church. Um, actually, I was an altar boy at St. Peter's at Southport, and I think you're from Southport, Rod, or from thereabouts. Uh, so I did have, yeah, like I say, I was an altar boy. I, it wasn't a speaking role, though. <laughs> so this is unusual for me. Um, but. So I'm not used to the echo, so bear with me. I should also say that I did go to a concert on Friday night 
uh, with a close friend of mine and he texted me yesterday to say that he had COVID. <laughs> I've done multiple tests since, so I can assure you I haven't and I've already had it previously. But we did come very close, it seems, to knocking out the entire talent. Speaking of talent, what an amazing pair of young women, uh, Agnes and Teresa. What, that is absolutely incredible. Um, I really am blown away by that. And I'd like to also um, acknowledge and thank Wendy uh, Flannery, Senator, former Senator Claire Moore, and uh, Reverend Dr. Peter Catt for the invitation tonight. So, as Rod said, Human Rights Week for, for the Commission and Human Rights Day was on Saturday the 10th of December. Of course, it's the anniversary of the signing of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, absolutely foundational moment in the development of human rights around the world. And I was very fortunate um, in 2018, actually not long before I started in this role, to attend a meeting at the United Nations building in New York. It was a meeting um, for uh, advocates who were advocating for a new convention on the rights of older people. And when I arrived inside the UN building, I don't know how many of you have had an opportunity to go there, I'm seeing a couple of nods. Like this building, it truly is an inspirational piece of architecture. And I couldn't help but feel overwhelmed by the act of generosity on the part of the Rockefeller family to give up that huge swathe of New York real estate for, that, for the creation of this space for humanity to come together and make laws to prevent, hopefully, another world war happening ever again. And I think now when I see reactions from Australian governments to various United Nations initiatives, the most recent one being just with the Barrier Reef, with UNESCO, and I see that almost disdain for the role of the United Nations, and I think we need to pull that up we need to go back to the foundation of the United Nations and revisit the very reasons why it was established in the first place. And we need to restore that respect. So tonight's topic um, couldn't come at a more important time for me. And the topic that I was asked to talk about was child rights need to be at the centre of everything we do. And I have to say, after four years in my role as commissioner, originally as anti-discrimination commissioner, now as human rights commissioner, so much of my work has just pointed me in one direction, and that is the direction of children's rights. And tonight, I'll be talking about some of the issues that are confronting children in Queensland. And one of, I have to say, um, I don't pretend to have the answers. And as Rod uh, and Claire would know, it is extremely difficult within government to shift policies and procedures. But one of the um, perks of my job is that I actually don't have to come up with the, <laughs> the answers. My job is to actually tell the government what it can't do and when it's stepping over the line. We also do have a, a bit of a role in telling the government what they should do in order to comply with human rights. And I will talk to some of the things that I think the government should be doing so that I'm not just up here preaching um, without any offering any sort of solutions. I'm not taking your job just yet, Peter. <laughs> not that you don't offer solutions. but. <laughs> So, back in 2019, after I'd been in the role a little while, I had 
the responsibility um, of attending the Cleveland Youth Detention Centre in Townsville. And I don't know whether anyone in this room has ever, ever been there. I think Claire has. And I think one of the most confronting things I've ever experienced in my whole professional career was being taken to a wall inside the detention centre where they had Polaroid photographs of each child that was in the centre. And I think at that time there was 96 children in the centre. So they, when the child was brought in, they'd go through an admission process with the nurse, a photo would be taken. On the photo, they would write the child's name, the age, and where they were from. So I stood in front of this wall looking at the faces of 93 Aboriginal boys. And one non-Indigenous um, girl and two non-Indigenous boys. And it just really struck me that what I was looking at was the ongoing impact of colonialism. It's the only way I could explain it to myself. There were, the other noticeable thing was that the, there was a cohort of 13 and 14 and 15 year olds who were from Mount Isa. So it seemed to be that a younger cohort were coming through from Mount Isa. And I think from that moment, I have really been driven and returned back to that wall lots of times. When I've gone to various meetings within government and only to sit at a table and look at the table and not see a single Aboriginal face at the meeting and yet be asked to present solutions, it, it really does bring home just how far we've got to go before we address the issues of colonisation and empowerment of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities. So that issue is just one of many and I um, wasn't going to talk about the voice tonight but I might as well take this opportunity. When I hear people, well-meaning, intelligent people say, but they haven't explained how the voice would work, they haven't explained the detail, they haven't explained what it would actually do, how it would make a practical difference. I find it really exasperating and so I have to tell people, A, it's an advisory body, it has no political representation attached to it. B, it is so desperately needed. We need a voice, not just to parliament, we need a voice to the executive. And C, it will have practical benefits, undoubtedly, undoubtedly. And as someone who did work side by side with Aboriginal communities during the period where there, we did have a, an ATSIC, which was, a, although it had its flaws, had a lot of strengths and we really threw the, the, the baby out with the bathwater when we dismantled that sick. So, like I said, this is not gonna be a cheery speech, I'm sorry, but it's an important one. The other issue, and all these issues that I'll talk about are clearly interconnected. The other issue I wanted to talk about is the state of our watch houses in Queensland. So, some of you may recall Four Corners did a program back in May 2019, which exposed the situation. So right now, tonight, there are at least 50 children in a watch house. And some of those children will have spent seven or eight days in that watch house. And some of them will be on charges of car stealing, robbery, fraud, domestic violence. 
And there's ongoing litigation in relation to this issue that we may end up becoming a party to, so I won't talk about the lawfulness of it. But we need to talk about the morality of it. Closely related to that issue is school suspensions and expulsions. Back in 2013, the government of the day decided to give to school principals the responsibility and the power to suspend and expel school students. And prior to that, that responsibility sat with the regional director. Unsurprisingly, the rate of suspensions and expulsions has exploded. Queensland is way out on its own in terms of Australia's rate. And if you happen to be an Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander child with a disability who is in a, living in out-of-home care, then you are eight times more likely to be suspended or expelled than if you don't have those characteristics. Can anyone see a link between children being disengaged from education and suspensions and expulsions and watch houses and detention centres? And of course, then we have children living with disability. So many children being suspended and expelled from school because they have undiagnosed um, conditions. So, and of course, all these problems are compounded by, as, as Rod said, exploding inequality, homelessness, and climate change. So, I said that I'd present the uh, problems. I'll offer some ideas about some solutions. So first of all, I think we need to reframe the way we look at children. And this is where the United Nations comes, really steps in. When I was at that conference in, in uh, New York, there was a really simple image that I uh, a presenter from South America presented about people with, uh, who are aged and how they should be viewed. And instead of being seen as objects of charity, they should be seen as bearers of rights. And it's exactly the same for children. We need to stop seeing them as figures of paternalism and as figures subject to paternalism and instead see them as rights bearers. We need to place rights front and centre in every discussion involving children. And we must recognise that children do not live in silos. They do not live in the Department of Education or the Department of Child Safety. And if it's one thing I've really learned from government is we need the, the biggest source of systemic discrimination, in my view, are these siloed services. That is the problem. And it is so difficult. So we have a situation now in Queensland where the government has outsourced so much responsibility for, for service delivery to the community sector. And having come from the community sector, I can say that there are a lot of great things about that. But in outsourcing that, they've also outsourced their responsibility. And no one is taking responsibility. So when you have parents who can't take responsibility, families who can't take responsibility, communities who won't take responsibility, governments that won't take responsibility, service providers that can't or won't take responsibility, where do children turn to? So I think we've reached a point where 
instead of relying on the police, who are the only statutory officers left other than child safety officers to respond to situations. We need to have a minister for children's wellbeing with the power to direct resources right across government to work on strategies that place children's rights at the centre. And obviously that me means investing in the future and looking at primary prevention rather than tertiary consequences. We need to, as, as Clem said, as global citizens, take responsibility. And I think that schools are a community resource that really need to be reimagined as community hubs. Instead of just being seen as places where teachers work or where well-adjusted children go to learn, they really need to be seen as community hubs that bring in everyone else, bring in the community to wrap around all children so that all children get a fair crack at life. And Aboriginal communities also need to be seen as resources. And a lot of the solutions lie in Aboriginal communities already, yet they are not being able to be accessed because we have systems that don't allow Aboriginal communities to actually take responsibility and take control. So I know, and I, I want to say that a lot of what I'm saying is obviously very sweeping generalisations and there'd be people within government who'd be absolutely outraged at what I'm saying. And there are fantastic programs being done and there's fantastic work being done all throughout the community by various people and organisations. But it is not being pulled together in a cohesive, coordinated way that is protecting all children. So I'd just like to finish by thanking all of you for your commitment to human rights and to the work of the United Nations. Recently, um, we had the, con the Committee uh, on Torture attend Australia to conduct visits. It was a source of major embarrassment that that committee was unable to access all places of detention in Queensland and decided to suspend its visit and expressed deep regret about having to do so. And I don't know how many of you watch the Hollow Men TV series, but if you do, you'll have an idea of the significance of you know, how strong that language, deep regret, is in international di diplomatic language. So this, this was a serious embarrassment for Queensland and Australia. And again, it, it goes to the point that we need to start taking the United Nations seriously and giving it the respect it deserves. And I commend you for doing all of the work that each of you do in supporting that aim. So thank you. Thank you, Scott. That's a... Uh a very informative and timely reminder of why we exist in the UN Association and the significance of tonight's celebration of the International Day of Human Rights each year uh, and celebrating the Declaration of Human Rights. Um, and your focus on children, I suppose, draws us back to the sources of many, many challenges in relation to human rights uh, that start with the way in which we frame how young people are recognised uh, and the fact that they are not seen as holders of rights, um, but seen as the property of others. Uh, and in many respects, that is the genesis of much of the consequent problems that uh, community organisations, the churches uh, and the helping community throughout Australia encounter as people grow up through their life. 
um, and the traumas that young people experience, whatever their dimensions, but particularly where they are traumas that are exacerbated by the dysfunctionality of the state in its capacity to manage the affairs relating to young people, uh, in many respects is a source of the consequent challenges that emerge later in life, uh, whether it be uh, the recidivism of offending, whether it be domestic violence, uh, whether it be uh, emotional and psychological problems. These are all challenges that in many respects can have their source found in the lives of children. I think it was uh, Brian Burdekin when he was um, Commissioner for Human Rights uh, of the National Human Rights Commission, Australian Human Rights Commission, who wrote a seminal report on Australia's management of the rights of children uh, following the declaration uh, of the same name. And uh, I think it was only last year or so I heard him um, again point out how much of what he wrote about back in the 80s uh, was still relevant uh, to our current predicament and the, and the, and the slowness, uh, even if you don't call it failure, uh, the lethargy with which governments have managed to get on top of these things. So thank you, Scott. Uh, that was uh, a very heartfelt uh, contribution to the discussion of our organisation here tonight, and we're very grateful and uh, honoured to have you here uh, as Queensland's first Human right Commi Rights Commissioner to reflect on these great and important issues um, that we share with you. Thank you very much once again. Um, now, I, I don't know whether uh, Ang uh, Agnes and Teresa are still here, um, but I understand that they have offered to uh, do another round of national anthems, and uh, we might just uh, have a, a short little interlude where we invite them up again to uh, perform again for us. And they can uh, introduce their national anthems and let you know which ones they're going to sing. Agnes and Teresa. So we've asked Virginia to pick the country, so she picked uh, French, uh, Germany, and Italy. First we'll be singing. I Italy. Yeah. Fratelli d'Italia, l'Italia se destra delle mu di Scipio se cinta la testa Dove la vittoria le porga la chioma ci schiava di Roma e di Ola Creo. Now let's sing the France. Alonso found la patria, la joy de gloire. Arrivé contre nous de la tyrannie, l'étendard sanglant élevé, l'étendard sanglant élevé, un ton de vous dans les campagnes mouillées, ces furos soldats qui viennent de Chiran au bras. Ego reno fino campagnas, o sarva situens, formes mo bations, ma chans, ma chans, cancerepuis, Now we'll sing Germany. Waterland, Danish last uns alle streben, brutalit mit Person hand, Einigkeit und 
Recht und Freiheit, sind es Glück, gesund der Pan. Blue im Glanz, dieses Glück ist Blue hinter Schiff, Waterland. Aren't they fantastic? And to think they were able to do that 193 times in different languages, that is extraordinary. Um, thank you again, Agnes and Teresa. That was fabulous. I'm not sure why uh, Virginia chose those three countries, perhaps inspired by the FIFA World Cup that's on at the moment. Um, but the French are the only, la the only ones standing, so I suppose the, uh, the anthems to Germany and Italy can be <laughs> um, to uh, farewell them out of the World Cup. Um, our final formal part of the ceremony tonight, again, is a very special part of our ceremony this evening uh, as part of our Human Rights Day celebrations, and I'd like to invite our State President, Claire Moore, to come forward uh, to introduce this item and um, tell you about this uh, very special presentation. Peter, we are so pleased, and I'd like Annette to come up here as well, because Annette has worked so closely with you on the International Day of Peace process. So um, uh, we are so pleased as a part of the United Nations Association to Queensland to provide you with a, a piece of glass and, and a certificate <laughs> to acknowledge you as a life member of the United Nations Association of Queensland. Um, it was unanimous and uh, we know uh, that this is really such a special place for us. Nine years now you've welcomed us here for the Peace Lecture and your work in the wider community in terms of uh, cross-religious cross groups looking at things such as peace, the environment, most importantly refugees' rights, um, has been a, an absolute inspiration to people and seeing that churches do have a real role in the modern world, bringing together issues and bringing people across, across the religious groups. Uh, you hold positions both in your own church, nationally and at the local level on these important issues. But I think from my point of view, it's a fact, if you go to a social justice event in, pre in Queensland, you're gonna find Peter Cat there. Um, and not at the front all the time leading, but actually there being part of the community, standing up for justice. So for Peter, we are really pleased to be able to give you these awards. Um, and Annette, I'm gonna ask you to do it. Um, and there are um, pe people taking your photograph, of course, and then if you'd like to um, say something, but we are so happy to have this relationship with you and also to have this touchstone so there's a touchstone about whether what we're doing is the right thing. So, there you go. Well, uh, just a slight correction. I think that last year was our 11th International Day of Peace lecture. Mm. Um, yes, yes. Um, yeah. yeah. So uh, you know, it's been um, a you know a, a growing uh, relationship of trust and respect, and to work with Peter um, on peace events has been a real privilege. I've recently worked with Peter on a national inquiry that the National Peace Network, IPAN, ran throughout the last couple of years. Peter very kindly agreed to be the recipient of submissions that uh, related to social and community impacts of on Australian people of the wars that we've engaged in, particularly over the last 70 years, or longer now, since World War II. And Peter very recently travelled to Canberra for the launch of the final report on that very extensive require, uh, inquiry. So again, you know, wonderful opportunities to talk about peace, to talk about where we want to go to with the understanding, and there's so much in that for the Uluru Statement from the Heart as well. And, you know, we have, to, we have to look backwards to be able to look towards the future. And uh, we're all looking towards a future where our children, again, have a right to live outside of war conditions, have a right to live 
where finances aren't all going towards preparations for the next war, $170 billion to acquire um, eight nuclear propelled submarines. So these are all really big, important issues, and I won't say anything more, but it's just such a privilege and a, a pleasure to be working with Peter on, the, on these issues. Thank you. Uh, thank you. This actually came as a surprise because one of the things I do is uh, read the briefing notes for an event like this just before it happens. So I got home from a swim and I took out my briefing notes and it says Peter Katz getting an award. Oh, very good. All right. So thank you. So it is a delicious surprise for me. Thank you so much. Um, and it's a huge privilege. And um, as with many of these awards, it doesn't just belong to me, it actually belongs to a whole community of people. And one of the things that is a huge privilege for me is to actually to be part of this community of faith that actually holds to the stuff that I talk about. So it's not as if it's sort of Peter Catloff doing his Red Dean sort of stuff and everybody else going, what the heck's that about? The community fully backs what we do and as does the wider diocese. So our diocese, just in the last couple of weeks was the first church to, to sign up for supporting The Voice as advocates. So it really is a privilege to be part of a leading edge church uh, in uh, Australia. And uh, so I take this award as an award for the work of the church and the churches because one of the other great things we enjoy in Queensland is incredible interfaith uh, solidarity. So uh, I'm a member of a group called uh, ARC, which is the Australian Religious Response to, Cl to Climate Change, and that has people from many faith communities working uh, towards addressing climate change, which we see as the, if you like, the overarching issue. <coughs> but behind all of that is actually human rights if we don't actually treat people as being essentially uh, carriers of dignity, which actually gives them the right to bear rights, then we actually degrade everything. And one of the truisms is how you treat your uh, least members is, is how in the end you'll treat each other. And so we've heard many stories, thank you Scott for this evening, if we mistreat our children, we will actually mistreat each other. If we mistreat our First Nations people, we will mistreat each other. And if we mistreat the planet, we will mistreat each other. So it goes back to that really basic of the dignity of being human. We're fast approaching the feast of Christmas, which I actually see as God affirming humanity. I actually don't take the view of God coming to rescue us, but actually God at Christmas saying humans are so wonderful I want to be part of with them and so it's actually an affirmation of our dignity and our dignity gives us the right to be right bearers. So thank you, it's a really great privilege and a wonderful surprise, thank you. Thank you Peter and uh, a very well deserved uh, recognition of your contribution not only to our UN family here in Queensland, but as you pointed out, to the broader family of, uh, the, uh, of faith um, and to the broader community. Um, there are plenty of churches that do not show your leadership, and I think we as a community here in Queensland should feel very honoured uh, that the Dean of this cathedral, uh, the leader of this diocese, has uh, such a dignified uh, awareness and commitment uh, to leadership in the field of human rights, dignity uh, and the environment. The work you do is wonderful. Um, we'd be much the poorer without it and we are most grateful to call you our friend and now our life member. So just to close tonight, Agnes and Teresa are going to perform one more time um, with their um, We Are Australian Salute to Nations. Please welcome to close this evening's proceedings, Agnes and Teresa. I came from the dream time, from the dusty red soil place. 
I am the ancient heart, the keeper of the flame. I stood upon a rocky shore, I watched the tall ships come. For 40,000 years have been the first Australian. I came upon a prison ship, bound down my iron chains. I cleared the land, endured the lash, and waited for the rains. I'm a settler, I'm a farmer's wife, on a dry and barren run. A convict, then a free man, I became Australian. I'm a daughter of a digger who saw the mother alone. The girl became a woman on a long and dusty road. I'm a child of the depression. I saw the good times come. I'm a bushy, I'm a battler. I am Australian. We are one, but we are many. And from all the lands on earth we come, we share a dream and sing with one voice. I am, you are, we are Australian. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Rod, so much. I actually do get to close it. Um, I do want to acknowledge the people from our committee who are here with us this evening. Annette was here, Wendy, actually Annette and Wendy, come up here, um, Rod, Clem and Natalie, please come up. You know, I, I just want people to see the members of our committee who are here with us this evening. Um, I want, and Virginia Balmain, Virginia, please come up because I really want on behalf of all of us to thank you for doing the organisation for this evening. You've put so much work into it and it's been like the, um, I'm sorry, Peter, the gods have not smiled on us this evening with the COVID impact, but Virginia, please. So these are the people who actually are on our committee. We've got a number of apologies for uh, illness as well. Um, so I wanted you to see them. Uh, and to embarrass them for bringing them up, actually. But in terms of the process, I do want to particularly thank um, Peter for you in the St John's community. Um, it is a fabulous place. We love being here, and it makes our event so much stronger. Scott, you've been thanked, but you know it was great and con confronting, and actually reinforces why we need to do this work. Um, to the Seroptimists the lurking down the back, thank you so much to the volunteers from the Seroptimists Association who are going to make sure we get um, tea and sustenance now, so um, thank you. Uh, to uh, everyone that has worked with the UN Association to make sure we have this event, it's a keynote element for our association, so thank you for you brave enough and well enough who've joined with us this evening to make a statement about the importance of human rights. There are people at the back who are taking donations. Virginia actually identifies particular groups each year that we'd be wanting to support. So this year it's um, the Education for Aboriginal Children, the STARS Foundation, which is a very well-known organisation. You can Google them and see. So if anyone gets the urge to actually tap down the back, that would be great, wouldn't it, Virginia? Um, so we can support the STARS Foundation. And also, as we go home, I don't think we could let tonight go past uh, without acknowledging what's happening in Iran at the moment in terms of all the areas where there are horrors happening across the world, the particular horrors at the moment in Iran and the resilience and strength of those people to stand up for their human rights and now the imprisonment and now the first executions are happening for people taking their stand on human rights. At another level, I think we should also acknowledge that um, the New South Wales government has just put down a penalty of 15 months imprisonment for someone who was taking their human rights to protest in the streets. Um, pretty sad 
pretty sad that we've got that area. So it's a number of things to think about. So thank you and enjoy. Now, go and enjoy. We have to do a bit of the stuff we've done over again because the camera didn't work. And some of tonight is actually going to Indian television. So um, ignore what's going on here. Um, and we'll go through and remember what we said earlier to thank the AFP um, the uh, foundation and also to give Clem his award. So just pretend we're not doing it. So thank you very much. And Rod, Rod, no, no, Rod as the stand-in MC, I mean, he's always very shy and quiet, but nonetheless, a great effort to keep us going. So thank you, Rod.